uh, just I will go straight go uh, and start it. So we, uh, this is just a brief um, background. I said this is an approaches. Uh, normally we get uh, like a three different kind of scenario or, or situation while we do work on invasive species management. Oh, this you can also tell as these are the events which occurs one after another, just like a uh, first we have a species with the invasive invasive potential, uh, and and those species species might get introduced in the, in in, the, in your place or in your area or in your island, and if not, we are not able to control or eradicate it. Those species get established. So what I said is invasive species management is the first line of defense in controlling the pest. So if we if we pass the recently into, uh, inter introduced stage, the middle uh, stage, it's very difficult after they established in our environment to control. We need to uh, spend lots of energy and lots of research, lots of other things, and it will stay for years to go. And just an approach to give species that has an invasive potential, we normally use approaches of a biosecurity at the port of in entries, like surveillance, quarantine regulations, and <clears throat> public awareness. And as an extension agent, I, you know, I don't uh, contribute much in that stage, but accept this public awareness. And uh, as a scenario on Kauai, we have lots of species which has invasive potential, which has already in the other island, neighboring island, and it might be here at some point of time. So that's, that's why we need to be very, <clears throat> very vigilant on these species, just like Queensland longhorn beetle. Lobic lag scale is uh, uh, here one time, but um, our DA, DOA folks has able to control that in one nursery. No, this was a uh, long time ago. Lobic lag scale was here on Kauai when I was working, uh, working with Dr. Cheng. And it was on the, on the uh, department, department nursery store here on Kauai. So, so DOA guys are able to control that lobby class. This that was you know four or five years ago, and avocado lace bug was also here uh, like a six months ago in the nursery, but it was it was taken taken care of. So, and high scale coconut rhinoceros beetle and coffee leaf rust now. So, so the next stage uh, or next scenario will be recently introduced species, which we we normally implement early de detection and rapid responses. So within these uh, stages, I have a yellow oriental scale, coffee berry borer, and rapid coherent, which I will be talking today. And there is a species that has been established. There are lots of species which, which, which are already established. So we normally implement IPM and other control methods, some specific control methods, if there are, there are some. So lots of species. And this is the and 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 in this stage, I would uh, be talking today on diamond back moth, uniform nematode on sweet potato and forestry termite on citrus. So, as an extension agent, we contribute a lot in the in the stage when there is a recently introduced species. We to team up with Department of Ag, uh, Island Invasive Species Committee to to to. <coughs> to form uh, rapid responses to, to try to eradic eradicate and limit the spread of the invasive species. And when it gets established or some species get established, we normally, uh, <coughs> normally based, uh, based on the research uh, outputs, we try to <coughs> train the growers and the, and the industries on the IPM of, for controlling those uh, Invasive, invasive pests. So the oriental scale uh, response. So this is a new scale in papaya. We usually call this is a new scale because uh, the papaya has already another scale, which is white piece scale. So this is the first specimen I got from the farm at Kekaha funding farm. Actually, when I went there, they, they, they gave it to me. And this is the sample I sent it to Dick Suda. Then Dick Suda uh, 
pass to Janice Matsunaga and at the end at the USDA Research Lab, it was confirmed as new scale insect, which is Oriental yellow scale, Ornidella orientalis. So this species is in somewhere else, Australia and the Indian subcontinent. This is highly polyphagous. It, it infests lots of, uh, lots of fruit trees like citrus, ficus, mango, papaya, banana, and it's also infest uh, palm trees like coconut and arachna. So what we thought is that this has a high uh, invasive potential. And apart from this, the first record of this paste was on the picture, on the fruit of a picture species farm in a nursery on Oahu 2009. And this was the, and this was on September uh, 2018 was only the second incidence of this uh, scale insect here on Hawaii. So after confirmation of this, uh, this new scale insect, uh, I communicated uh, in, with the, in the uh, Hawaii Tropical Fruit Growers Associated, uh, Association meeting, I had a little presentation on this scale insect at that time after the, after the, after the, after the confirmation. So, uh, so then I came up with the SDOA folks here in Oahu in Kauai, as well as, as well as Oahu and, <clears throat> We surveyed uh, surveyed the farm three by three uh, uh, in in January at the end of January uh, 2019. As you can see in this map, these are the uh, lines. Are the we are we are three people, uh, me, Eric from Eric and uh, Eric and Craig from Department of Ag here in Kauai. We walked through all the trees, and what we found is we found around. Uh, I think it's uh, 16 trees in, in whole farm. There is uh, 8,000 papaya trees and we found 16 trees with the uh, new scale insect. And, you, uh, and we, uh, we, we, scale, uh, we scored a infestation scale from zero to three, three being highly infested and zero being no infestation on the fruit trunk and leaf. As you can see, three is the highest I think we have around 17 trees with the high infestation of this scale insect. So this was done in January 13 and the grower was um, repeat, uh, periodically applying uh, petroleum oil to suppress this, uh, this, uh, this uh, scale insect, which I think is doing a very good job, but because it was not spreading all across the uh, farm at that point of time. Then, after two or three months, uh, SDOA Oahu recommended us to apply imidocropid for, for uh, completely healing the, uh, healing the scale. So we did spray first time in the May 1st and the second time in the July 3rd, uh, around a uh, two months uh, space. And after, after a week after the second spray, we again went back and took the, took the data on the infestation scale. Same 16 trees, 16 trees, and we have only scale, presence of scale in the around seven trees, one, yeah, seven trees. And this is the scale density, high, heavy, uh, or low, and scale health. And even there is a presence of scale, all scales are dead. So what we thought was this scale insect, insect was eradicated on from that farm. So good news. Uh, we are happy and but unfortunately when we when i went back to went back to that, that farm on november 2019 then i again saw the scale insect in figure in the field three and four so these are the field field one two three and four and and, and on field three and four i found again some scale insect uh grower continued to spray uh, petroleum oil which works fine. And after some point of time, the grower uh, dismantled. They, he just plowed down field one, two, and four for various other reasons. The phytophthora root rot is the main reason. And also this variety what, what, which they use is a kapoho solo, which doesn't do well in Kauai environment. So he dismantled uh, two first, second and fourth field. And also 
third field, one with the scale. The third and fourth was the, uh, the field where we got the scale insect second time. So for now, up until now, he destroyed all the papaya, all the old papaya trees. And, for, and also for now, I do not observe uh, scale insect in his new plantings. Not the old plantings, old plantings are all already gone. Uh, last year by June, now he has uh, some new plantings, but I do not observe any scale, new scale insect on the new planting. So again, showing some the scale insect in the trunk and in the fruit. <clears throat> So not too bad. So uh, half half feeling if we did a good job or if this insect doesn't have an invasive potential because it looks like it flourished seasonally. We saw it in the September, October, November. In second year, it appeared in the November again. And there might be, or this might be a low competitor with the, uh, the, the old, in, old scale insect. And and also it has some uh, natural enemies and a coccinated beetle and a parasitoid. Maybe that might be the instances we eliminated uh, natural enemies and it boomed in the second season as well. So you know, we will keep, um, keep eye on this scale insect again on that farm especially because we didn't find these scale insect in other farms here on Kauai. So yeah, maybe this is not too much invasive and we, 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 we might need to uh, think about this scale insect too much. So any, anyway, good news. We are less of one, one new pest here on Kauai. And <coughs> the second one, coffee berry borer. Uh, so coffee berry borer was confirmed here on Kauai, September 2020. So immediately after uh, its confirmation, CTAR, SDOA and KICS joint uh, a joint team uh, responded to this this invasion. We had a CR CBP response team, which I I used to I usually coordinate. So this uh, CBP response team had a uh, uh, SDOA folks from Kauai, from Oahu, Becky, Darcy, Kevin was there also there, and we have a uh, Andrea Kawabata from Big Island, another extension agent uh, for the especially for the coffee, and and Kiss. So this response team meet, meet, uh, we met uh, weekly until the November. And then after that, we uh, now nowadays we are meeting only monthly to discuss and update on CBB uh, status and, and plan activities for, for the, uh, for the uh, next, next month or week or so. So as a response plan, SDO led the survey for CBB uh, that started from a uh, Weiwei Street here, the first positive site, uh, and 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 then uh, continue to uh, survey around that area. So up until now, we have twelve positive sites, and but this uh, map shows only nine positive sites. So first positive site and then bunch of sites around that area, it went to Lawai. So the fifth site is Kauai Coffee Farm here. And then it went to Lawai. And the 10th site is the NTBG at Kalaheo. And there is a couple of more sites on Lawai. So we jointly responded uh, in the eight positive sites, whoever is willing to, uh, willing to cooperate, cooperate us, we went to those sites or that property and, and, and eliminated the infested coffee, very bore infested plant, or, or if they don't, do not want to remove the plant, we strip the beans uh, from the branches. So we are able to do uh, from the eighth site, NTBG did by uh, themselves, and the first positive site, which is a, a homeowner at Weiwei site, uh, he's doing by himself as well. So it looks like we have only a couple of sites uh, which are not taken care of at this point of time. So these are the few pictures uh, of doing a response, uh, cutting the, uh, eliminating uh, coffee trees or stripping them, stripping the beans from the infected plants. 
and, and safely disposing. And after cutting the plants, we are putting the traps to trap the residual CVV from the infested area. So immediately after the uh, discovery of coffee berry borer here on Kauai, CTAR organized a workshop just after a month uh, in October <clears throat> to update the status and to create some awareness on, uh, on the presence of CBB here in Kauai and CBB IPM for coffee, uh, coffee growers and the community. Well, I think this, this is very important because earlier the better, yeah? So, so everybody knows and so maybe we don't have to have to have to survey uh, survey intensively as uh, as they will they, they the coffee growers or the or the homeowners know if they have a copy they can come to us tell us or send the samples uh, that they, they, they had a you know, coffee berry borer infestation so up until now, apart from Kalaheo, Lawai area, CBB has not been detected on the other parts of the island. So, which is uh, also good. So for, for now, all the coffee beans are being harvested. Uh, and as long as, so maybe it, it, will, it will soon flower and there will be green berries. So, so maybe there is a, that is the time, again, we need to be more active in surveying and doing a uh, uh, more extension work as well. So we plan to do another another uh, workshop after a couple of months to again update on status and CBB IPM and whatever we uh, we usually do in a in an outreach program. So the the another response uh, which I am. Um, involved with is a rapid ohia death response. Uh, so this one is a little, a little bit out of my circle. And also there is a lots of people involved in this rapid ohia death. So, so my only contribution to this response is to support, is to co contribute USGS project on understanding the role of ambrosia beetle on the spread of uh, rod here on Kauai. So normally, uh, <clears throat> In this project, uh, they are trying to understand the beetle activity in the rod infected trees, and uh, and what uh, what I usually do is I get the bolts from our KISC or DLNR, and I I, I bring it to my lab and rear the ambrosia beetles from the infected bolts. Up until now, I got um, maybe uh, twenty eight bolts, and um, I finished rearing beetles from twenty bolts, and I got. 435 beetles, and the primary ambrosia beetles from these bowls is uh, Xyloborinus saxini, the small ones, and lots of other different kinds also. So these uh, species are identified by Robert Pick at the USGS Big Island. And another activity on this uh, pr project is monitoring beetles in the Oia forest using traps. And this, this has been uh, withheld with this COVID related uh, situation and I, I hope this this uh, activity will also in the floor very soon. So, so uh, so uh, let's go back to some uh, old insect, uh, you know, which are which are already been here on from many many years. Uh, among them, uh, the, the diamond back pot is the. One which uh, I choose to work on uh, because it's a very tricky pest. Uh, so what what it does is it develop resistant. It has developed resistant to many different classes of insecticide. So why I work in this uh, in, uh, insect is one of the farmer came to came to tell told, told me that he usually spray his kale every other day with radiant or interest or beauty and he cannot control the diamond back mud. So I went to his farm and tried by my, myself, doesn't succeed. So that's why I, I choose to work on this insect. So for this insect, I collaborated with, uh, with a statewide uh, team with Robin Smaboku, which, which is another fellow senior uh, extension agent at uh, Maui. Uh, he just retired a few months ago. 
So it's an insect resistant management. So it gets, it develops resistant soon. So that's why we need to rotate the insecticide class to, to control this insect. So this is the lab at Maui where we did bioassay of several different insecticide on diamondback moth larvae. This is the, uh, I'm doing a insecticide dilution. And what we do is we have a, a leaf ticks of caddis, which will be dipped in the different insecticide for a few seconds, then dry it and in, uh, put it in the pressed petri dish. And in, in each petri dish, we uh, introduce 10 second instar larvae of GBM. And as you can see, some insecticide are effective and some not. So this is the overall result of the bioassay. We have a different insecticide, uh, some seven or eight different insecticide, and this is a more percentage mortality after uh, three days. And what we get is the radiant doesn't work good. Uh, radiant and momento, momento doesn't work, did not work. Uh, and this is the, this is, we did this for the Lihui population. And radiant so, and DBM population is resistant to radiant, but uh, some other insecticide, Exeril, Dorac, and Brooklyn did very good job, and Avant, Coragen, and Remote is useful. It, it kills more than fifty percent of diamondback moth within the three days. So, <clears throat> based on this result, uh, what we what I recommended to uh, our Lihui. Uh, uh, Christopher Gore is, so use new insecticide. Other they, they usually use radiant interest and the BT. So you at the start with using a new insecticide. So new insecticide can be one of these. So here on Kauai, uh, the growers can buy only Corazin. Well, they can, we, but the other insecticides are not available unless they go to uh, Oahu or they order from Oahu or Big Island. So they can get only Corazin here. So they, they, they can start with uh, Corazin. So they can do two spray in a sequence at one uh, monthly interval, no, at weekly interval in a month. And in a subsequent week, they can, they can spray these BT. They can change BT. So out of four weeks in a month, they spray two two sprays of insecticide, the new insecticide, and they can do filler spray in a, a remaining two weeks with these BT. They can uh, stay with one BT or they can uh, choose one, uh, one BT and another BT in the next week, next week. So in the next month, if they go to next month and if they choose to spray next month, they have to choose another one. So another they don't have or they don't have, they have a only, only Corazin here on Kauai. So they need to stay with only two spray because Corazin cannot spray more than two times in a cropping season. So if they want to choose, they want to spray next month, they need to choose another insecticide which they don't have. So again, next month they can spray new insecticide two times at weekly interval and then fill in by BT. Then after two months, which uh, we think that all the resistant population has been killed in a two, two months spray of new insecticides. So, so they, can, they can again go back to again, less effective, less resistant, in in less effective re uh, insecticide means radiant and, in uh, radiant and interest after they can go back to those in insecticide after two months. So uh, they tried this uh, this method and which which uh, looked very very good. It, it worked very good in controlling diamond back moth and other cat caterpillar insects in the Lihui farm here. Yeah, so we have around uh, 15 to 18 immigrant farm farmers here on Lihui. So <clears throat> this method worked very good and there is no problem of diamond back moth um, for for up until now. And this uh, this recommendation was uh, delivered in a in a workshop uh, in a in a IPM exten extension work of uh, funded extension extension work workshop is funded by Mark White. Again, so this is the insecticidal control. So there is a lots of other uh, growers which is organic, 
And, and we have another uh, project, team science project uh, led by Kunhui Wang. And they did some research in, on Oahu uh, using trap crops and using entomopathogenic uh, nematodes on trap crops. And they found uh, brown is better in controlling all the caterpillar insects. So we did similar trial here on Kauai uh, using brown mustard as a trap crop, trap crop to control uh, uh, the caterpillar base. So there is a lot of different caterpillars. They're not only diamond back moth, but whatever we do for diamond back moth is also good for another, like a uh, cabbage butterfly, uh, cabbage looper and so on. So, so we tried a brown uh, mustard trap crop in a cabbage to control, but but result was not very uh, not very significant. Uh, it it uh, didn't work here uh, on 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 Kauai in one of the farm here. You know, it's, it's a Chinese farmer. So we still plan to do another trial using not not brown mustard this time, but uh, pak choy, uh, with the application of intermopanasonic nematode. Uh, it's 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 it's, it's uh, it will be. Uh, on the on the on the field very soon, within a month of time or so. So, so new new insect, <laughs> sweet potato in veniform nematode. So when I just started this job uh, around, uh, I started this job March two thousand eighteen. So, so there was a reniform nematode outbreak in one of the farms. Here it's at Kapai, Kapai, and on, on, it's close to Wailua Falls. Uh, it's a 300 acre sweet potato farm. And he has almost 70% of the sweet potatoes infested with the reniform nematode. The, the tubers uh, infested with the reniform nematode will be offset, flat, uh, it's cracked, and it's, it's called a slipper set. It looks like a slipper somewhat slipper. So what I did is I responded with, with this uh, call and went on, went on to sample the soil from the infected field and from the pasture land on from the fallow field. What I got is there is a 2017 nematodes uh, per 250 cc of soil, uh, very high. Pasture has also 700, which is, as you can see, 500 is the threshold threshold uh, for reniform nematodes uh, for the sweet potato, potato growing. So too high in the infected field, which is obvious, and this is also high in the pasture field. And in fallow field, it's, it's less. So what we recommended this time is just rotate the field. Just, uh, so it's, it's a, it's a, what I understood now is if you grow sweet potato in a new fallow field, no problem. It's very easy to grow sweet potatoes. You just wait until six, seven months and harvest. Second year, you will see some problem with the nematodes, some uh, nematode infestation, some weevil. Uh, but when you plant this sweet potato in the same field for the trolley, you, you will get very less, like 70% uh, reniform nematode uh, infestation. So uh, the idea is to rotate the field uh, you always grow sweet potato in the newer, newer plot. I think, uh, and that's what uh, this farm does because he has lots of uh, area, 300 acres, and he switches field from one field to another field. The uh, testing of nematodes in the other land is also for the same purpose. So, so that she, he can switch the field in the upcoming. And as a result of this uh, response, I got some funding from a state legis legislature grant, and I was able to screen the uh, sweet potato variety for nematode resistance. So what I did is I got 12 sweet potato varieties, USDA, six USDA improved ones, five Hawaiian locals, and a commercial variety, which is Okina purple Okinawan. Hey, do, I, do I still have time? Can I, can I go ahead? I, um, I, I don't mind, Rashawn, okay, and okay. hopefully. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, yeah, looks like I'm 70% done. I will try to go faster. And we took soil sample uh, two times, and we also recorded this yield data. Uh, not much conclusive uh, result uh, for the nematode count. This is for the only first time. But some of the Hawaiian locals uh, has a less uh, from nematode count. 
the can kyo kyo hui eighteen b kona b Macau all local Hawaiian local one purple lc is also local but high uh from nematode so uh, for this we don't have we cannot say which one is the uh, resistant these improved variety regular rudy so among the improved variety small has a less small has a less count so uh, more on sweet potato we have we did sweet, sweet potato workshop and field day in the same day on 2019. For the second year in 2020, we screened 48 sweet potato varieties, which has just been harvested. We will have more results on the nematode as well as we will resistant for sweet potato varieties. And these uh, from, uh, from the uh, 48 sweet potato varieties, we will pull out the good ones and we will do another variety test in 2011 this year. So I was also involved in Sweet Potato National Clean Plan Network project uh, led by Susan Miyasaka in uh, Big Island, which we will be getting uh, four clones of uh, disease-free uh, tissue cultured uh, Okinawan purple. And we will be multiplying these in, in the, at the station in greenhouse and distribute dist and will distribute to, to uh, your growers. The main thing is it's disease-free and it yields four times more than the uh, regular uh, Okinawan purple. And also a development, a NIFA multi-state grant on sweet potato IPM is administered by um, Kunhui Wang. And we are hoping this will be granted. If this is granted, there will be lots of work uh, 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 that I, I might need to do as well, which is good. So uh, another uh, uh, project for this tree termite. Uh, Termites are pro not only problem in the house, but in a, in a, in a little bit of a, an old age citrus orchard, uh, it's very problem. Almost all the trees are infected with the termites as you can see here, see? And what I found is these termites are disturbed by the ants. These are the ants, which is uh, uh, big headed ants, I think. I haven't seen them feeding on the termites, but they are disturbing the termites and and displacing from that that area. So, so what I uh, what 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 I thought is we will enhance the activity of ant, then displace the termites from the citrus tree. So for that we use uh, biodegradable calcium alginate jet with the twenty five percent sucrose as a source of ant. So this I did. Uh, I'm doing. I'm collaborating with Jiawei K. Uh, <coughs> this is not project funded. Just just for our interest. Uh, and and the grow, growers' interest as well. So, so the main idea is to uh, give uh, more sugar uh, and uh, increase the activity of ants so that they can displace uh, termites from the trees. And also, so what we thought is they are eating, they are feeding on the protein source. And when they eat protein source all the time, they might be a little bit bored. So we give a little bit of new food so they can eat sugar sometimes and sometimes uh, protein as well. Only one kind of food is not good for anybody. They don't like to eat all the time, same, same thing. So these are the uh, trial setup. We uh, selected the 12 trees. We treated uh, six trees with calcium alginate gel and six trees co controlled the calcium calcium alginate gel looks like this and it's spread around the trunk of the tree and I'm, for now I'm taking a data on ant activity uh, after uh, one day after treatment five day 10 day and 20 day after a month I again uh, <clears throat> apply calcium alginate gel and as, as I expect as I said I will expect the result of less termite infect infestation on the treated tree and, and a similar research is also funded by the Western IPM to manage sudimol in the citrus with the application of a calcium alginate gel, which is uh, infused with the EPN. Uh, so in this project, we will kill the ants so that uh, the, the, the scale insect on the citrus tree will be exposed to natural enemies and there will be less sudimol. So these, these will be uh, in the field uh, very soon. So other potential project that I'm interested um, on the basis of extent of problem, which is a root rot disease of papaya. 
very bad here on here on Kauai. You will see these uh, these trees. Once it rained for maybe three or four or five days, so something needs to be done for the root rot diseases in papaya. I initiated this one uh, in a, one of the farmers' field, which is just, just kind of superimposed trial. They're using a fungicide called redo meal at the in in the seedling springs. Redo meal mixed with the fertilizer in the seeds in the, at the seedling before planting. Then uh, after planting. Two months after planting, I had a treatment of spraying redo meal, drenching redo meal, and spraying redo meal plus uh, coside. So another interesting post, uh, 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 project will be on ambrosia beetle boring on the younger uh, younger avocado trees. So, so these are the pests of nursery. I, I see them mostly in the nursery and the younger younger uh, avocado trees, they usually in uh, bores in the main trap, not uh, unlike the other, unlike when a black twig borer, they try to bore in the uh, branches in the twigs. So <clears throat> we will think about this, how to do, we need some kind of small research because I don't get answers from the literatures and the, and the other experts. So another disease is Karpke Park disease. The, that one first one is a Langsat. The second one is on lychee, uh, which uh, looks like a. So, um, uh, according to literature, what it says is there is no cure for this disease, and this disease can stay, stay, stay in the tree, and and the tree will be trees will be fine and ill, ill substantially, but it doesn't look like in one of the place where I went with the lychee. Uh, they, uh, they had about 100 trees of lychee and almost all the tree, uh, lychee trees are infested and doesn't look good. I think they cut down already, already three to four lychee trees. So, so these are the potential other projects. So uh, some of these uh, pictures shows how I involved with the community on the Kauai County Fair where I, uh, working with the little kids on building the building your own butterflies and ag awareness day i was uh, teaching about the invasive species this is a sweet potato field day where we we did uh, uh, taught about sweet potato varieties uh, reform nematodes weevil and also distributed some cuttings of sweet potatoes as well and uh, this is a uh, some garden fair and this is an ag awareness day before this job in 2017, where I was showing a coconut rhinoceros beetle to the school kids. Apart from these, I also uh, uh, teach Go Farm, Go Farm students, uh, also teach uh, master gardeners, and also uh, teach uh, KCC classes on request. KCC classes, uh, couple, uh, high school and middle school classes, if they request me to do that. That I'm happy to do that kind of stuff too. Uh, networking. Uh, one of the main uh, project uh, I do in this job is the networking and communication between the stakeholders involved in uh, invasive species management. We ha I had a invasive, very functional and very active invasive species working group, which usually uh, meets uh, one quarterly. In the past years, uh, and as a as a result of the invasive working group, we, we were able to do uh, organize an invasive pest conference last year at Big Island Imaloa, as you can see this picture. And I have a very good feelings about this. And, uh, and this year, uh, because of COVID, we are not able to do the in-person in, uh, pest, uh, invasive pest conference, but uh, in the past uh, uh, few, few times, this invasive species working group meeting I was able to modify these meetings into mini conferences. And the last one, last week, 02, 18, February 18th was the fourth time. And, <clears throat> and which is very good. This the main objective is of this working group is to bring the, all the stakeholders involving in work, working group in the same forum and communicate, exchange our knowledge in between us, which, which, which looks like a working very fine. I have a very good, feedbacks when I did survey uh, around August and October. 
So uh, we'll, we'll keep on doing this. So this, this will be my uh, last slide, uh, building a statewide extension program on invasive pest management. So, so as I said, we have an invasive pest working group, uh, which consists of lots of different stakeholders from his uh, DOA, a lot, all the uh, island uh, invasive species committee, real our Hawaii Ant Lab, uh, uh, DOFA. So, so, and we usually meet at least now uh, once in a two month. So what is the, and CTAR, we, we mostly use uh, research outputs from CTAR as well as USDA. So basic idea is what we need, I need a smaller group from an invasive pest working group. Smaller, which is called a Hawaii, which we'll call Hawaii invasive, invasive pest team. So, and that team will deliver uh, uh, outreach, outreach programs to the, to the statewide client, clientele uh, or growers or the industry, industries for edible and ornamental crop industry, industries. So this is the plan and this, this has been communicated with our CTAR extension team as well. So hopefully uh, this will not stay as a plan also, it will be in a, some kind of effect. So basically this Hawaii state invasive team will compose up mostly outreach personal extension agent from CTAR from uh, all the, uh, from each island. So they will deliver a statewide invasive species management outreach program to whole state. And, and uh, among, so, so it will be statewide uh, extension program, but there will be a need-based uh, localized uh, individual island program as well. So with that, I, 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 I would uh, say thank you. If there is any question, I will happy to take. Thank you. Thank you, Rashad. Mm -hmm. that was, that's a lot of work. I don't know how you find the time in the day or the week to get all that done. Uh -huh. Um, I think we were supposed to have a poll, and I, I, yeah, I was skipped gonna, over that. Do you mind so. if we, I, while everybody that is here, um, while you're thinking about the questions to ask Rashawn, we'd appreciate mm -hmm. if you took just a couple of seconds to answer two questions yes, on sure. this poll. It helps with our planning in the future, and mm -hmm. any questions that you have can be entered into either the chat or the question and answer, um, discussion, questions, anything. So we'll just leave that pull up for just a moment. And you did, Rashawn, you did get some mahalos in the chat mm -hmm. already. <laughs> so maybe I cannot answer to the poll, I think. It doesn't No, no need, yeah. yeah. No only, need only the so. Hindi. And, and just um, so all of you know, um, I'm gonna go on, it looks like we've got a couple more seconds on the poll, but um, this is the fourth and final week of the Hawaiian Invasive Species Awareness Month um, virtual presentations. Uh, there are a few more presentations coming up this week that we hope that you can join us with. I'm gonna end that polling. Thank you all for, um, for sharing that with us. And looks like you're getting more mahalos, Rishan. Thank you. But I cannot see it. How can I? Oh, okay. 11. Oh, someone, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll read them off. Um, okay, okay. Lori yeah, Rollins, I saw it down. Mm -hmm. Lori Rollins from Ashland, Oregon said, many thanks for your work and information. Mm -hmm. um, Gavin says, thank you for the info. And uh, JB Friday from UH Sitar uh, Hilo says, Roshan's help is greatly appreciated by the Rod Working Group. It would not be possible to bring infected logs to Hawaii Island to rear out here. So I can see. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. It takes and a I'll village. And I'll just do a quick plug, Rashawn, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Well, oh, we got a question. Here we go. JB Friday was asking Is there some sort of fund to compensate farmers who have? to destroy produce that's contaminated by a new invasive species. Otherwise, farmers might be reluctant to report a pest if it means destroying a crop. So, so for, for this question, I said, I, I don't know. 
<laughs> uh, I'm not aware of this. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> It might be something we have to look yeah. into and yeah. um, maybe speak to someone at the legislature about reporting. Okay, well, I think um, got another second. I'll give one more um, shout out to this week. Um, the Invasive Species Awareness Month is focused on Kauai, um, as you saw with Rashawn's uh, talk today. If you go to Kauai ISK's Instagram, there is some really great, um, they are doing a, a whole series of um, interactive um, walks through different places in all over Kauai. There's also going to be a presentation um, a little bit later at one o'clock um, on cats, toxoplasmosis, and monk seals. And I guess for that reason, we do need to jump off here and go to the DLNR His Kaisam website to see the full what's left for this week. And um, also to see all the videos that you or webinars that you may have missed earlier in the month. So, or you can check out, or you can check out the um, uh, HISC um, Facebook page if you have access to Facebook. And with that, um, Rashawn, thank you. And thank I'm you. going to thank end this. It's going to kick us all off. So just a heads up. So mm -hmm. mahalo to everybody. Aloha. Thanks, Rashawn. Thank you.